The knowledge of normal US anatomy is the basis for the orientation in endoscopic ultrasound. Therefore, the training of important anatomical landmarks is mandatory for each endosonographer. The main message of this video is how to find the anatomical guiding structures in the upper abdomen in radial endoscopic ultrasound. According to the perpendicular axis of the ultrasound plane to the axis of the instrument, EOS guided interventions are impossible. If the instrument is positioned along the longitudinal axis of the body, for example in the esophagus, 360 degree transverse ultrasound section images originate. These are comparable with transverse abdominal ultrasound CT or MRI images. Therefore, it is recommended to turn the endoscope in a position where the artery is located in the lower part of the image and the liver in the upper part. On the left side of the image is now right in the body and on the right the left side of the body respectively. In the moment where you leave these positions, for example during the passage into the antrum or into the duodenal bulb, you will see atypical sections through the body. According to the radial scanning plane, you have to use pull and push maneuvers predominantly. Rotations to the right or left are only required to adapt the section plane for the axis of important vessels or ducts. For the demonstration of the guiding structures, ultrasound frequencies between 5.0 and 7.5 MHz are recommended. The focus of the ultrasound machine should always be placed at the point of interest. In the upper abdomen you have three important reference positions to identify the anatomical guiding structures. First, the cardia second, the duodenal bulb, and third, the level of the papilla. Following the descending aorta, you will find step by step the exciting arterial vessels. First, the celiac trunk with common hepatic artery and splenic artery is visible. These vessels imitate the image of a flying bird. The left gastric artery is only presentable if the instrument is carefully withdrawn until a cross-section of this small artery appears. Granularly to the celiac trunk in front of the artery, the echo diaphragma is located. Close to it the pearl-like celiac plexus can be seen and should not be mistaken for lymph nodes. A few millimeters caudally, the origin of the superior mesenteric artery can be shown in a cross-section in front of the artery. In between the superior mesenteric artery and the ventral wall of the artery, the crossing left renal vein is in sight. The splenic artery and the more caudally located splenic vein can be followed by a withdrawal and rotation to the left into the splenic hilum. These vessels provide a good orientation for the examination of the pancreatic tail and body. Once you have identified the splenic vein, it's easy to follow the vein into the splenoportal confluence 
by a careful rotation to the left. The superior mesenteric vein reaches the confluence caudally. Therefore, you have to push the instrument downwards over the level of the confluence. In addition, parts of the pancreatic head and of the uncinate process are observable in front respectively behind the confluence. If the transducer is now turned further to the left, laterally to the confluence, the pancreatic head, which encircles the confluence, can be shown. The caudally running pancreatic duct can be seen in cross-section. To follow the portal vein, the endoscope should be turned further to the left and pulled back. Now follow the portal vein to the portal bifurcation. Close to the transducer is the common hepatic artery, which accompanies the common bile duct and the portal vein. Together with the hilum, large parts of the liver are visible and should always be included in the examination. On the turn back to the aorter, it's possible to see the origin of the left renal artery together with the vein as well. They can be followed into the renal hilum. In between the cranial pole of the kidney and the aorta, the left adrenal gland appears. In the ventral position of the anterior gastric wall, the left liver lobe with the segments 2 and 3 can be seen. By a withdrawal of the endoscope, the interhepatic veins can be followed into the inferior cava vein close to the diaphragma. For the passage through the pylorus into the duodenum, optical orientation is necessary. If you fill now the balloon with water, a sliding back into the antrum is prevented. Again. From the duodenal bulb, parts of the portal hilum and the gallbladder can be seen. The gallbladder can be examined by push and pull maneuvers. Sometimes, after passing through the pylorus, the rigid tip of the instrument can reach the wall of the duodenum quickly. Therefore, care should be taken and the instrument be rather pulled back the tip angled downwards and slowly moved into the second part of the duodenum. As in ERCP, the instrument has to be straightened, whereas the scanner will lie considerably deeper than the papilla. By retracting the instrument, a very typical V appears, which arises of the mesenteric vessels on the right side of the image, that means ventrally, and the aorta and cava vein on the left side, that means dorsally. These vessels are landmarks for the pancreatic head. The vein is running cranially into the confluence, the artery into the aorta. To reach the papilla, the instrument has to be withdrawn in a left position. In normal anatomy, the pancreatic duct and the common bile duct are visible in the echopureventral part of the pancreatic parenchyma. The common bile duct lies close to the transducer and can be followed by a careful rotation to the left to the cystic duct and the infundibulum of the gallbladder.
The main pancreatic duct is running into the echo-rich dorsal part by pulling back the instrument.